JavaScript was popular even before async await, back when life was full of callbacks. But now async await is fairly mainstream and it's actually quite easy to use and at its core, we have the async keyword. To specify that a function is an async function, we use the async keyword and you can use it pretty much whenever you would create a function, for example, a function declaration, a function expression, even arrow expressions and even class methods. A key thing to remember with async functions is that they always return a promise. So even though these functions don't have a return statement, we will still get back a promise when we invoke them. This promise will resolve based on the returned value and as we know, when a standard synchronous function does not have a return statement, JavaScript still returns the special value of undefined. So all of these promises will actually resolve to that same special value of undefined. We can verify this behavior by running this code and as you can see, we get back four promises that resolve to the value of undefined. Just like when we resolve one promise to another promise, the fates of the two become one and the same. It also applies to async function return values. When an async function does not return a promise, for example, here we are returning a simple string, then the promise from the async function immediately resolves to that value. However, when an async function does return a promise, then the fate of the returned value is going to be the same as the fate of the returned promise. In this particular case, the promise that we are returning gets fulfilled with the string value of fulfilled. So of course, that is what we will see in the then callback for the returned value. However, if the promise that is returned from the async function gets rejected, then the returned value will also get rejected. And here we are handling the scenario with a simple catch and logging out the error message. So now if we run this code, we see the simple value immediately, then fulfilled gets resolved, and then the rejected value goes into the catch. Async functions gracefully handle all errors that occur inside of them and turn them into nice and easy to deal with rejected promises. To recap, when we have a standard synchronous function and we make a mistake, for example, we are invoking a function that does not exist, magic is not even defined. If we invoke it, then it will result in a synchronous throw from the JavaScript runtime, which must be caught with a try catch. Async functions, however, always return a promise, which means that they do not throw an error synchronously. So it is perfectly safe to call an async function and store the value in a result. And as we've seen, what we really get back is a promise of the result. So if an error does occur in the execution of the async function, what happens is that the promise that is returned is what gets rejected. So in this particular case, the result promise will get rejected with an error by the JavaScript runtime. And of course, the error message will be the same as what we saw before, which is magic is not defined. Now, of course, magic is not defined as sort of a coding error and the JavaScript runtime is what is throwing that error, but we can throw an error ourselves as well using the throw keyword. And this too will get converted into a promise rejection. This is why we have always been using an error object whenever we are rejecting a promise because a promise rejection is an asynchronous version of a synchronous throw. And we've already discussed during error handling that you should always throw an error object and not some random string. Now let's run this code to verify it works as expected. And of course it does. We have our synchronous error caught with the message logged. We have our asynchronous errors caught as promises and logged using catch handlers. Now that we understand how the async keyword works, we can take a look at the await keyword and how it behaves in an async function. We start off with a simple async function that allows us to use the await keyword. And to kick us off, let's look at when we use the await keyword on something that is not a promise. There is absolutely no point in doing this. This await operator is completely useless. It just gives back whatever is passed in. And as you will see, it will be exactly the same as the original string. The real use case of the await operator is when we use it on something that is a promise. For example, here we have a promise that gets fulfilled to the string fulfilled after two seconds. If we use the await keyword before this promise, the code execution within this async function will essentially pause till the promise fate is settled. In this particular case, this promise will get fulfilled and the await keyword will give us back the fulfilled value. So for this particular example, if we log out the fulfilled result, we should see that string fulfilled. Let's create another promise, but this time we will make this promise reject with an error after two seconds. If the promise that we are awaiting results in a rejection, then the JavaScript runtime will throw a synchronous error into this async function. The thing that will be thrown will be exactly the same as the value used for the promise rejection. If you don't catch that error, it will go all the way to the async function result, which of course will be that rejection value, but we can catch it within an async function by using the standard try catch. 
Here we are using a wait on the promise that will eventually get rejected, but we have been smart enough to wrap it up within a try. And of course, as soon as this error gets thrown, no further statements within the try will execute and it will jump straight to the corresponding catch block. So within our catch, we should see that error message, which of course is that string rejected. If you run this code, you can see that for not a promise, there's no point in using the await keyword. Then we wait for two seconds till the second promise gets resolved and we get back the result. And then we wait two more seconds till the next promise gets rejected and we catch that within our catch handler. We've looked at how even promises by themselves clean up the callback hell and async await just takes that to the next level and brings the true convenience of everyday synchronous programming to the async world. Consider the simple task of creating a function that takes a callback and then it should call it three times each time after a delay of one second. We create a simple utility function that we've seen a few times which simply takes a millisecond value and then returns the promise which we eventually resolve after those milliseconds have passed by using a set timeout. Now let's work on the function that meets the requirement specified. Of course, it's going to be an async function that's going to take that callback. And now we can just create a promise using our wait utility that will resolve after one second and use the await keyword to pause execution till that promise resolves. Once that promise resolves, we will invoke our callback and then we will again wait for one more second, then again invoke the callback and then do it one more time. Let's demo this main function by giving it a simple callback that logs the message hi. And now when we run this code, we get that hi message each time after a delay of one second. You might argue that what's the big deal? I could do this pretty easily with the promise then chain. But what async await really unlocks is the ability to do any synchronous programming you want, like a for loop that does the same thing five times or any number of times that you provide. And in each iteration, we have that simple await for one second, followed by a call to the callback. With async await, you almost don't even have to think about the fact that you are writing asynchronous code. Async await has made asynchronous programming extremely easy and it's most apparent when working with backend APIs over a network. For this demo, we will use the simple API provided by GitHub, which is api.github.com slash users. And you can provide any user ID. For example, here I'm providing my own and you can see the sample response. And there is a lot of stuff on screen, but let's focus in on how we could read the name, the Twitter username, and then make another request to the organization's URL to read all the organizations that this particular user belongs to. We will be working within an async main function. And we start off by using a built-in API called fetch. And this API is available on browsers as well as Node.js. It takes a simple URL string and returns a promise that eventually resolves to an HTTP response object. As we know that the body of this response is JSON, we can actually convert it into a JavaScript object by using the JSON method on the response object, which again returns a promise. So we simply await that as well. This gives us a JavaScript object version of the JSON payload that we were looking at and we can easily read the name and the Twitter username properties. We can also read the organization URL and let's make another fetch request using the organization URL to get another orgs response. And again, parse that from JSON by using the JSON method. And this time we will get back an orgs array. Each item in the array has a login member, which is basically the name of the organization. So for the organizations, we simply log out the individual org.login properties. And now for the moment of truth, let's open up the terminal and execute this code using Node.js. And as you can see, we can read the name, the Twitter and the organization names. And this was all pretty simple thanks to promises, the fetch API, which works on promises and async await. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial as always. Thank you for joining me and I will see you in the next one.